The Cavalcade of Kings. George the Second. The Cavalcade of Kings rides on. George the First, founder of the Guelph dynasty, has passed, and his son George the Second, who succeeded him as Elector of Hanover and King of Great Britain and Ireland, approaches. George the Second was born in Hanover on the 30th of October, 1683. In 1705, he married Caroline of Anspach, a woman of many attainments and a great force of character. In 1743, George showed great courage at the Battle of Dettingen, the last occasion on which an English sovereign took part in actual warfare. In 1745, the French won a hard-fought battle at Fontenoy in the Netherlands. This war revived the hopes of the Jacobites. France once more favoured the cause of the old pretender Sam. Charles Edward, Bonnie Prince Charlie, and he landed with a few companions in the Western Highlands, where we now find him calling upon the clans to help him regain the English throne for the Stuarts. Men of Scotland, with courage and perseverance, will conquer all before us. The clans are all well represented here today, because loyal Scottish hearts beat strong and true beneath their respective tartans. Fierce, proud, courageous hearts, through which flows the unsullied blood of the invincible Highlanders who were their forefathers. Hearts which will not accept as king the German you suffer from across the water. <laughs> My father, James Stuart, was deprived of his throne because he stood firm for his religion, claiming the right of every man to worship God in his own fashion. His sufferings and many disappointments have sapped his life's blood and left him but the husk of a man. But I'm young, I'm strong, and I want vengeance for the injustices and humiliations that have been showered upon the royal house of Stuart. And I, the last of all line, am ready to fight and willing to die for the honor of my house. Will ye follow Charles, who is your rightful king, or are you content to remain the vassals of George of Hanover? Give on your broadswords! Give voice to our ancient Gaelic battle cries and to the droning of the pipes. Let us march on and on, never turning back until we've fought our way to freedom. George II and his wife Caroline were seated at dinner at Whitehall when news of the revolt was brought to them by the Prime Minister. Henry Pelham. <laughs> oh, 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 Caroline, my sweet. Not another word, I pray you. But, my dearest, it is perfectly true what I've been telling you. <laughs> the gander, such a huge gander, George, was chasing poor old Martha round and round the kitchen garden. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tell me, what did Martha do? Well, you know how fat she is. She could do very little except pick up her skirts and waddle as fast as she was able into the kitchen. <laughs> Even <laughs> then the gander <laughs> pursued her. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, George, <laughs> a good laugh is like a tonic. <laughs> but I'm sure our statesmen and ministers would be shocked if they could hear us. <laughs> oh, well, even a king must laugh sometimes, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. I wish I were a simple peasant woman, nursing my babies, churning my butter, tending my ducks and fowls, and most beautiful of all, awaiting the return of my dearest to his supper after his long day's work in the fields. Oh, and why would you prefer the simple life of a peasant to that of first lady in the land, my sweet? If I were a peasant woman, I could have you all to myself. I wouldn't have to share you with England, your ministers, your courtiers, and your people. Oh, I know I'm being selfish, George, but I can't help it. You see, there is only one man in the world whom I love, and that man is you, the dearest and best husband that any woman ever had. Oh, but Caroline, I fear me you'd lose your ardor for me if I were forever tied to 
your apron strings. Oh, we've been married 40 years, George. And I still feel a nasty little ache in my heart every time we are separated from each other. Yes, even though it's only for a day. Oh, you dear sentimentalist. <laughs> yes, I suppose I am. And it's very stupid of me at my age. <laughs> but I'll never change. Oh, I hope you never will. You know, dear, all my life I have been misjudged, unloved, unwanted, even hated by my own father. Then you came into my life and gave me the tender sympathy and love for which I had craved so long. Have I meant so much to you, George? Uh, I refuse to answer that question, my sweet. You're just angling for compliments, and I will not add to your conceit. <laughs> oh, George, I'm not conceited. I was only curious. I'll tell you this, though. Your old husband adores the very ground you walk on with those absurdly tiny feet of yours. <laughs> you used to be very proud of my feet when I was a young girl. Oh, I still am. They're the daintiest little twinkling things I've ever seen on a woman. I really must kiss you for that nice compliment. Oh, not before the footman, dear. See, he's just entered the room. Mr. Pelham has arrived, sire. He begs that you will receive him at once. He says the matter is very urgent. Mm. I will see Mr. Pelham. Conduct him here. Yes, Your Majesty. It is most unusual for Mr. Pelham to disturb us at this hour. I wonder what has happened. Well, we shall soon know, my dear. Ah, my dear Mr. Pelham. Oh, good evening, Your Majesty. Forgive this intrusion upon your privacy. I've come on a very urgent mission. Well, be seated, sir, and let us discuss the matter over our coffee. Uh, thank you, sir. Now, tell us what is causing you the concern which I see so plainly upon your face. The Jacobites have risen again, sire. And with Charles, the oh. young pretender at their head, have invaded England. Oh. They have passed through Cumberland, Lancashire, Derbyshire, and are rapidly moving south. Has he many followers? The Highlanders are loyal to him, and the Catholic malcontents are flocking to his banner as he passes through the various towns. Then a small force must be sent at once to intercept the young fool and his hot-headed followers. And if a small force is inadequate to deal with the rebels, sire? Then I shall send an army commanded by my son, the Duke of Cumberland, with orders to stamp out these Jacobites who constantly harass the peace of my kingdom. The battles of Preston Pans, Falkirk, and finally in 1746 Caledon were fought before an end was put to the last of the Jacobite revolts. Charles escaped to the continent where he afterwards died. During the war, the brothers Pelham became the two chief ministers. The elder, Thomas Pelham, Duke of Newcastle, was a most incompetent man, but cunning in intrigue and the art of bribery. The younger brother, Henry, who was prime minister, was nearly as good a businessman as Walpole, and whilst he lived, party strife was hushed. He died in 1754, and the style of William Pitt rose on the horizon. He was the greatest statesman of the 18th century. There was also John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement. What Pitt did for politics, Wesley did for religion. It is now 1760, and George II is lying on a couch under the trees in the palace gardens. He is very feeble and ill. William Pitt is with him. Pitt. What a strange country this is. I have never known but two or three men in it who understood foreign affairs. You are one of those men. It is my duty to understand foreign affairs, sir. Ah, I wish Newcastle had devoted a little more time to the subject and less time to his absurd intrigues and briberies. If he had, we may have avoided the last war, which dragged on and on for seven weary years, followed by Admiral Bing's shocking cowardice in the Mediterranean. Admiral Bing's conduct was dishonorable and discreditable, sire. But the man has paid the supreme penalty for his lapse, and I, for one, say, let his soul rest in peace. Ah, yes. 
You are very pure in thought and noble in character, my dear Pitt. But I'm afraid idealism will not help England in a crisis. Sire, had it not been for idealism, England would not be England. Why do men go to far-off countries to do battle for their motherland? It is not always the lust for slaughter that sends them, nor is it always for mercenary gain. It is something more noble, more glorious than those mundane things. They go forth to fight for an ideal, and I pray to God that it will always be so. Pitt, as I lie here in the evening of my life, thinking, dreaming, and waiting for the King of Kings to call his servant home, a deathless army of England's great sons pass like a vision before my tired old eyes. I see each man with his particular background, his particular victories and triumphs. Robert Clive and the Battle of Plassey, which gave India to England. Wolfe at Quebec, which gave Canada to England. John Wesley, who through his earnestness raised the whole tone of English religious life. Then I see you, you Pitt, standing firm as the rock of Gibraltar, safeguarding our destinies at home and abroad like the brilliant young statesman that you are. Yes, Pitt, perhaps you're right. Without the idealism of her sons, England would not be England. The honor and the glory of our motherland is an ideal worth fighting for, sire. It is indeed, and I thank God for the blessed idealists who have made the reign of George II of England prosperous and victorious with the glorious luster of their heroic deeds.